We're all done here. This is the T1 V2 in custom loop form. And I'll share with you what's in here, some belt ups and how well it works. Welcome to Machines and More. This personal build in the formed T1 V2 has taken quite a bit of planning along with a lot of trial and error, but it is up and running smoothly. Before we get started here, I did want to thank our sponsor today. This video is brought to you by Aura. On this channel, we focus a lot on making your PC build work as well as it possibly can, but also very important is keeping your data safe. Identity theft is the fastest growing crime in America, and there's a new victim every 14 seconds. I'm excited to partner with today's sponsor, Aura. Aura is identity theft protection, fraud monitoring, a VPN, password management, and antivirus software all combined into one easy to use app. Now imagine if your email account password was changed by a malicious actor, and then in a few hours you start getting fraud alerts from your bank and your credit cards. Kind of scary, right? But it's happened to many people. Fortunately, Aura monitors the dark web for your emails, passwords, and social security numbers and sends alerts fast right to your phone and email. I've gotten quite a few credit report and identity verification notifications and shockingly, 20 notifications that my information has shown up on the dark web. It's good to know what's potentially compromised. Protect your family and yourself from identity theft. Try Aura free for two weeks with my link in the description so you can see just how many times Aura finds your info on the dark web. And hey, let me know in the comments below if it does. All right, let's talk about this build. I covered some of the build considerations previously and uh, we won't get into that again today, but uh, I'll tell you what's inside. So for the CPU, I'm using the Intel 12700K. That's eight performance cores plus four E cores. It's a very good CPU for both gaming and productivity right now. For the motherboard, I've got the ASUS B660 ITX motherboard. You might wonder why the B660 instead of the Z690. Well, and while I think the CPU block would fit just fine on the ASUS Z690 ITX board, I did still have a few concerns based on how meaty and thick everything on the perimeter of that board is. Uh, the B660, it's a little bit more tolerant, leaner in terms of the layout. You still got two M.2 slots, and with the single radiator, I'm not doing any overclocking anyway, so any power delivery enhancements just wouldn't be as critical here. And of course, the Z690 is a heck of a lot more expensive. One other board I did consider was the MSI Z690, but since I had this one already, it was just easier to stick with it, and it's actually a very good board. RAM is the 32 gigabyte Kingston Fury DDR5 kit. This is a 5600 megahertz kit at CL40. Not a flashy looking kit, but it works very well. On the GPU side of the house, we're looking at the 6800 XT, and all these components are powered via the Lian Li SP850 power supply here. I've got the stock cables. As far as the custom loop components go, the CPU block is a combo unit. This one's the Lobo from a new company called Mod Ultra. Big thanks to them for letting us check this one out. This consists of a cold plate assembly which connects directly to the pump housing and the attractive looking cover with a Waves graphic here actually doubles as a heatsink for the DDC pump complete with a thermal pad. Now I haven't tested the pump temps just yet, but the pump cover, it does feel warm when the system is running. So for sure it is making good contact and it's drawing some heat off the pump. Initially I had the back plate uh, on the uh, underside of the motherboard rotated the wrong way in the last video. I did fix that, which I think gave the back side of the motherboard just a little bit more clearance. Uh, the GPU block is the Alpha Cool Ice block. It's good looking, don't care too much about the lighting, but I did set it to just one color, so at least I can see the air bubbles as the loop is getting broken in now. At the top, one single rad. This is the XSPC TX240, and shortly we'll talk about just how well this works. But it is an ultra thin rad at 21 millimeters thick, and that is paired with two Chromax uh, Nocto NFA 12x25s. And each fan is connected to a separate fan header on the motherboard. I'll explain why in just a moment. After building this, well, I can confidently say that a 30 millimeter fan under the power supply, that's just gonna be too tight for this build. And I think these black fans, they make for a better aesthetic statement anyway. Also big thanks to Fantex for supplying their glacier fittings for this build. There are quite a few fittings here. I counted six rotary elbows, three T's, two adjustable extenders, 
eight soft tube fittings and a bunch of uh, stop fittings as well. The T's were used along with G quarter plugs so they can serve as additional fill points, but the primary fill point is adjacent to the GPU ports. It's from the alpha cool flow indicator and the T near the GPU port. Finally, the tubing I'm using here, it's EK's 1016 ZMT or zero maintenance tubing. And I think the color, it blends right in. Although if I do get bored of this, I'll probably just uh, bend some hard line for this if I wanna change things up, but I'm happy with it for now. The loop, it does go from the CPU pump block to the radiator, then it goes to the GPU side. Uh, from the radiator to the GPU's inlet to the outlet and then back through to the motherboard side between the motherboard and the power supply. Then it re-enters the CPU block. Probably most of the time spent on this build was in dry fitting things and repositioning the center divider, the riser cable spacing, you know, putting the power supply in the right position, just general experimentation. Although, you know, there's really very short amount of tubing involved here but I did have to make sure that everything was the right length that I wanted and if it would all fit in here. The nice thing about this case is that if you do want, you can build the case around the components and then you can put the support ribs, the bottom and top covers back after putting it on together. And if you do need to adjust something, it's actually very tolerant because you can just take it all apart. Right? So that's one thing that's really nice about the T1. I didn't have any custom cables for this power supply, so I worked with these stock ones. They're fine, but there's still quite a bit of excess cable. And making sure the cable management is tidy and out of the way of the fans is very important, especially since there isn't room for a fan grill on the motherboard end of the case uh, on top of the fan. The nice thing about this particular sandwich layout here is that you can pretty much have everything in place as it is without having to put it together slowly or connect it together as you go. You can kind of just dry fit everything, visualize it, then connect it. Since for the most part, all the ports are easily accessible, but there is one area that I did have to build into place and that was the connection between the CPU block and the radiator. Uh, since those two are connected with an adjustable hard fitting, I did have to slide those together into place and then position the rad, you know, attach it to the uh, top cover here. I didn't use the radiator plates. I'm actually not sure if it would have been in the right position since the fan under the motherboard, it's right up against the, uh, the bottom of the motherboard. Uh, I was planning on attaching the rad to the top directly anyway. And so for that, I've gone with the countersunk 632 screws here. For the most part, I did have to have the cabling connected up before I looped it all together. Although for the section under the power supply, I did find it easier to remove the 24 pin cable from the motherboard, you know, completing that pass through section and then plugging it all back in. Filling it up was relatively easy for a loop without a reservoir. Usually these combo pump blocks, they're a little bit tricky to fill. So to avoid that, I uh, set up this section here, like I described, and that way I can flip the case upside down then I can fill the loop by just opening up these two ports and then the air exits, you know, liquid goes in. So with some slight tilting and shaking, I got 95% full and then just pulse the pump by connecting it to an, a separate power supply. And that allowed me to push out a few more air bubbles into that flow indicator, top it off. So right now it's about 99% full already. I'm using XSPC's clear concentrate that I mixed up here. Pretty reliable stuff. After running it for a little while, it does appear to be mostly filled and good to go. Got a few bubbles here and there that are working their way out slowly. So what I'll do is just top it off later on. Uh, right now it's perfectly fine, but uh, you know, I didn't wanna make sure it's completely bled out. Maintenance should be relatively simple here because um, I did get to test that out. After firing it up for the first time, I noticed that the GPU temps were totally off. So something was wrong. I did have to remove the block, checked it, and all I had to do was drain off enough liquid from this port over here. And then I just pulled the block and it turns out the block wasn't contacting uh, half of the die. So I had to put a little bit more thermal paste there. So all good now. Performance, here's where I was a little bit concerned. With the Meshlicious build I did, that was a single rad, but that was with the Hardware Labs GTS 240. And that's one of your best standard thickness rads. Uh, and that radiator and the fans worked well with a 5800X and a 3070FE, but this one is an ultra thin rad. Plus this build is a little bit more tight in terms of the airflow spacing around the fan. So I was resigned to already not do any overclocking with this. At 1500 RPM on both fans and stock boost settings, it maintained close to 4.7 gigahertz reliably during two back-to-back -back blender renders. And it settled in at around 80 
85 degrees, which really isn't out of ordinary for this CPU during an all core render. And at this usage, it is running at around 166 watts CPU package power. For the GPU in Heaven 4.0, it's settled in at around 66 degrees. Power draw on this card is 265 watts at total board power. And I just did a quick and dirty undervolt directly from the Radeon software, which really is never as aggressive as it can be, but it's just an easy way to get an idea of the impact. The auto undervolt dropped it to 245 watts or so, and the temps settled in a bit lower at 64 degrees or so, but already a noticeable improvement there. Gaming at stock settings, I ran Far Cry 6 for about 30 minutes. The stock GPU is settling in at 67 degrees and the CPU at about 67 and a half. This is with 1500 RPM on both fans. Estimating the coolant temp by probing the radiator, it came in at 42 degrees, which is just fine for a setup like this. The lack of an onboard temp probe header is a bit annoying considering that ASUS has it on their B550 ITX board for AMD CPUs, but then again, even the Z690 ITX from ASUS doesn't have one. I didn't put a fan controller in this one just yet. I'm looking at the Aqua Computer Quadro. But uh, for now, I've got the fans connected to separate headers. And with that, I can use a program like Argus Monitor and have one fan indexed to the GPU temperature and the other one indexed for the CPU temp. So that way there's some granularity and balance to the control. Otherwise, in a situation where perhaps you're only indexing to CPU temps and BIOS, you're gonna have a problem if your GPU happens to be running and your CPU is relatively cool. Anyhow, considering that this is with the fans at 1500 RPM, there's still some headroom there all the way to 2000 RPM, but the main benefit over something like an AIO and an air-cooled GPU setup is simply eliminating the GPU fans for a quiet operation. And in a standalone CPU scenario, I have the benefit of having that 240 and 225 millimeter fans instead of a slim one that you might have to use with an AIO. And uh, for grit gaming, the thermals, they appear to be comparable uh, to that type of setup, except you don't have the sound for the GPU fans. This powerful supply fan does get a bit audible as we saw in the review. It's not terrible, but it's absolutely a higher pitch noise. The one thing I am gonna do is tinker with uh, the undervolt a little bit more on the GPU. And as the loop breaks in, I'll go ahead and top off the remaining airspace. But all in all, I am very happy with this one and it's been a really fun build. All right, so I hope that gives you an idea of what is possible in this case. I think it's a very worthwhile build as long as you are reasonable with your component choices. Uh, probably don't throw a 12900K and a 3080 into this build if you're gonna see heavy load on both components simultaneously. But you know, if we're gaming only, you might just be totally fine. Any questions, please let me know down below. Give a like if you've enjoyed it. Subscribe if you haven't. Links are down below for the components. And thanks for watching today.